Hello, uh, my name is Phil. I'm the priest in charge of the Draycott and Lem Valley Benefice. Uh, and this is one of our August videos. Uh, so usually uh, we pop up a video every Sunday, uh, which is the preacher from one of our services, uh, sort of pre-recording what they're planning to say. Uh, so if you couldn't make it to church or you did, but want to hear the sermon again, uh, you can. Um, we're not doing that in August, just because with annual leave and people being away, it's harder uh, to get it up uh, and online at the same time each week. So we are putting up a video every week uh, in August, but it's not necessarily on a Sunday and it's not necessarily what's been preached in the pulpit. Um, and I think this gives us a chance to try different things and offer uh, different videos. Um, so, uh, so far uh, this month, uh, we've had a video up about common worship where I've talked a little bit about common worship uh, and we walked through the communion service in common worship. Um, think about what was where and why. So I hope that was um, edifying for some people. If you haven't seen it, it sounds interesting to you. Uh, do check it out. Uh, then last week we filmed um, our bit narrated BCP service at Frankton. Uh, so if you uh, enjoy the PCC or B PCC, BCP, uh, or you've never been to a BCP service, uh, but you're interested uh, in what goes on there, do check that out. We, we, we have a communion service, uh, but in place of the sermon, uh, George uh, shares a little bit about the language of the BCP. Uh, and we also try to um, walk you through and talk you through what's going on. So hopefully people feel more comfortable uh, and enlightened about the BCP. Uh, so that went up last week. And now this week, you've got me talking to camera again. Uh, it's not a talk or a sermon um, in the traditional sense. It is, and let's call it what it is, it's a bit more like a lecture uh, this week, because what I'm doing is I'm recycling a little bit of my uh, dissertation from Theology College. Uh, so at the end of uh, my third year at Theology College, I had to write a dissertation. Um, and in my dissertation, I looked at preaching and the place of humour in preaching. And broadly speaking, it was about actually, is it right to use jokes uh, when you're preaching? Uh, it won't surprise you to know that I concluded yes. Um, but as part of that process, I looked at humour in the Bible and where the Bible uses humour. Uh, so I thought what I'd do is I'll share that part of my dissertation with you via video in the hope that it may be interesting, uh, it may be amusing, uh, but more importantly, that it may give you a deeper understanding of some parts of the Bible and an eye for spotting the humour, which I hope will make it come even more alive when you read it. So that's, uh, that's what I'm planning to do. Um, I'm going to start initially just by talking a little bit about humour and theories of humour. So I think it's going to be the most kind of academic -y bit bits um, of it, but it's important to understand what humour is before we start picking it out. So, um, so yeah, apologies if this bit is a little bit dry, but I hope once we move on to the Bible, um, it will come alive a bit more. Uh, so the first thing is think about what is humour. And I turn to this book uh, quite a lot um, when it came to working out what humour is. It's uh, The Naked Jape, Uncovering the Hidden World of Jokes by Jimmy Carr and Lucy Greaves. Uh, you may have heard of Jimmy Carr. He's um, quite a famous comedian, uh, quite a Marmite comedian. Um, a lot of his jokes rely on offending people. Uh, so, so if that's not your bag, um, he can be quite annoying and offensive. Uh, but the book that he's written here is not him trying to be funny. It's not actually offensive in that way. Um, he's actually just trying to get to the bottom of what jokes are and what is funny. Uh, so it's a good starting point for trying to work out what humour is and what is funny. Uh, and in this book, um, Jimmy Carr and Lucy Greaves tell us that they tried to count all the different forms of humour, uh, but they gave up when they got to 100. Uh, but even though there's so many different forms of humour and theories of humour, the theory of incredulity uh, seems to be kind of the main consensus that all the scholarly uh, articles on the subject um, come across. So the theory of incredulity uh, states that humour is essentially when we spot, see or have something pointed out to us that essentially grates or takes us by surprise. Um, so for example, um, if I took a joke from my uh, children's joke book, it might say, what reptiles are good at doing sums? Adders. And the humour here is twofold. Uh, firstly, it asks a question. Uh, which if you didn't know this was a joke, you might expect a serious answer to, but instead of that serious answer, you receive a wordplay, adder being both a type of snake and a reference to addition as a form of mathematics. 
But secondly, as well as that kind of pun, you also get this ridiculous image in your head of a snake with an abacus doing long multiplication sums. And that's the essence of the joke. But because it's quite formulaic, it can be uh, quite predictable. And so that might be why actually you groaned rather than laughing when you heard my joke. And that's why you end up with jokes like this. Uh, why do witches fly on broomsticks? Because vacuum cleaners are too heavy. Again, the humour is twofold. Uh, firstly, the very practical, sensible answer takes us by surprise because we were expecting a wordplay like with the adder pun. Um, and as we saw in that first joke, uh, the image of a witch flying around on a vacuum cleaner is quite silly. Um, so that's, uh, in essence, uh, what we're thinking of when we're thinking about humour, that idea of incredulity, something that grates or takes us by surprise. Uh, so the question is really, if that's what humour is, should we expect to find humour in the Bible? Um, and I think the answer is a resounding yes, because the Bible is the story of God, and it's, but it's also the story of mankind. So the Bible contains the full range of human emotion and experience. Uh, it's got anger, it's got betrayal, you get compassion, despair, elation, fear, grief. And in amongst all of that, there's humour. Uh, hum humanity, think about incredulity, so humanity stands in a very incongruous place. Uh, we're told in Genesis chapter 1 that we were created in God's image. There's something of the divine about us. But at the same time, we're told in John Genesis 3 that we're created from dirt. So who we are grates that precarious existence between dirt and divinity defines humanity and accounts for the humour and everything that we see all around us and all through our lives. There's something just inherently funny about humanity. As the Bible tells uh, the story of hundreds of individuals, uh, they each had their own flaws and their own personalities, and the nature of the humour contained within it is going to be as varied and as diverse as humanity itself. It contains so many different genres and styles of humour. Um, we're going to kind of pick out some of them um, in this video. Uh, but before we do, I'm just going to acknowledge uh, three reasons that we as kind of modern readers may find it difficult to spot humour in the Bible. Um, so one of those is that much of the humour involves kind of wordplay, like that adder joke that we looked at. So uh, just imagine it's sometimes hard to translate a Hebrew pun or a Greek pun into something in English uh, that conveys the same thing. So much of the humour uh, is maybe lost uh, when the Bible is translated from its original language into English. Um, so that's one reason it might be hard to spot the humour sometimes. Uh, the second reason it might be hard uh, to spot the biblical humour is that actually to get it, we need to make that effort to find, put ourselves into uh, the mindset of the people that wrote the Bible and the people that first read the Bible. And we're quite culturally removed from some, some of these cultures. So it might be that some of the humour kind of washes over our heads uh, because we don't understand the culture that it was written into and written for. And then a third reason that maybe we miss some of the humour in the Bible is that actually a lot of humour uh, relies on gestures, facial expressions, uh, tone of voice, that kind of thing, uh, which can be harder to spot uh, in the written word. So there's um, lots of reasons why we might miss um, humour in the Bible, but it is there and with a bit of help uh, we can sometimes um, spot it. Um, just to avoid being sued for plagiarism, um, a lot of what I'm about to say I've ripped off um, one of these two books. Uh, so this is Mark E. Biddle, A Time to Laugh, Humour in the Bible and Comrade Hayes and God Created Laughter, The Bible as Divine Comedy. So these two books uh, were really helpful for me, uh, yes, in doing my dissertation, but also in terms of my understanding of the Bible, what they do is they look at different examples of humour in the Bible, which actually, by researching that, um, it gave me a new understanding of different parts of the Bible. Uh, so I really hope um, if I share some of what I learned with you now, 
uh, that might help you uh, to go deeper as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of different genres um, of humour uh, and see where we see them in the Bible. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is absurdity. Uh, absurdity is a form of humour uh, where things are just just silly things happen or different silly perspectives um, are articulated. Uh, and it's a type of humour that's often found in a lot of those sketch shows that were so prominent uh, on BBC TV schedules in the 90s and early noughties. They're still around, you still see them on iPlayer, um, new ones coming out, but I think the 90s uh, were really the zenith of these kind of shows. Uh, and if we take, for example, the Rao sketch uh, from that Mitchell and Webb look, that will give us a bit of an insight. Uh, so in the Rao sketch, you've got David Mitchell and Olivia Colman, who are playing a married couple, and they're having a lot of uh, rows uh, that are being portrayed as kind of like petty annoyances with each other. And the two kind of key petty annoyances they're rowing about are the fact that he's had an affair and that she's got a gambling addiction. So it's a bit of a kind of sparky ma 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 at each other about these two things. Uh, but the kind of turning point uh, in the sketch is when you realise that these two uh, inconsequential rows that they seem to be having are actually masking something much deeper. And the, that much deeper thing in their relationship is this bitterness that she feels towards him for having forgotten to shut the fridge door. Uh, and the climax is kind of when the truth comes out and she shouts, I'll never see that quiche again. Uh, and the humour in this sketch centres around the fact that the male's character's affair and the female character's gambling addiction should be the things which put the pressure on the marriage. But the angst and the distrust in this marriage really centres on the fact that he didn't shut the fridge door and so the quiche was ruined. The fact that the real problems are secondary to the banal problem emphasise quite how banal the loss of a quiche is and conversely quite how serious an extramarital affair or gambling addiction uh, it should be. So there is an incredulity between the, fact that the real and the perceived stumbling blocks to a successful marriage. And now I'm pretty confident this sketch was produced primarily for entertainment purposes rather than as a commentary on social attitudes towards monogamy in marriage. But the sketch does illustrate how absurdity is potentially a powerful tool for making some quite serious points. And Jesus used absurdity to make a point on several occasions in the Gospels. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practised without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. The absurdity here is that someone should go to so much effort to ensure they do not swallow something as small as a gnat and yet manage to miss the fact that there's a camel in their drink. In the same way that David and Mitchell couple uh, were absurd because they were worried about the trivial, the lost quiche, rather than the really serious stuff, adultery and gambling addiction. The Pharisees are worrying about the trivial, herbs and spices, when the weighty issues to be considered are justice, mercy and faith. And that's just one example of this, but Jesus does it so often, he deliberately exaggerates a point to impress his, healer, his hearers. There's so many more. Why do you see the speck in your neighbour's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? The principle's the same, except rather than the absurd image of someone swallowing a camel by mistake, Jesus gives the image of someone trying to help their friend get a speck of dust out of their eye, oblivious to the fact they've got a log in their own, which is rendering them pretty much blind. And then this is one that I particularly enjoy. Uh, so whenever you give alms, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their award in full. This time the absurdity is that mental image of someone having a brass band follow them around to play a little jingle every time they donate some money to charity. The incredulity is the fact that no one would do this because it would look ridiculous. 
but at the same time the people uh, the people that he's talking to want praise for their charitable gifts and they're behaving as if having a band following around would be a legitimate thing to do. So that's absurdity as a form of humour and how we see Jesus using it. Uh, but what about some others? Um, another big one is physical comedy. Uh, there was a 1999 survey by a TV magazine which aimed to find the top 100 TV comedy scenes of all time uh, by conducting a poll. And in second place uh, came a really iconic scene from the 1980s TV sitcom Only Fools and Horses. Uh, and the setup uh, to this joke is that Del Boy and Trigger are in a pub. Uh, they're pretending to be yuppies to try and impress a group of women on the at the other end of the pub. Um, and um, they're just about to go over and, and chat to them. And Del Boy says to Trigger, play it cool, Trig, play it nice and cool. Uh, and then this happens. So uh, <laughs> the reality is that some people just find it funny when someone falls over, uh, which may be to do with that very human disconnect uh, between our divinity and our dirt, between our kind of our spiritual selves and our physical selves. Uh, and uh, Mark Biddle, uh, one of his books I showed you, Time to Laugh, um, offers us an example of physical comedy in the first meeting between Isaac and his soon-to-be wife, Rebecca. And then he argues that that's, this is one of those instances we've mentioned uh, where the humour is obscured by our translation from the original Hebrew. Uh, but if he's correct in his translation, then his passage is a very good example of physical comedy in scripture. So we're told in, uh, in the NIV uh, translation of Genesis 24 verse 63 that Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field. But there's some ambiguity about that word that's translated here as walk. Other translations, such as the RSV, translate it as me meditate. And Biddle argues that it's possible that this word could have been a Hebrew euphemism for relieve himself. Uh, and then the next verse tells us that Rebecca looked up and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel. That's the NRSV again, slipped quickly from the camel. But as Biddle remarks, the original Hebrew uh, uses a verb which means to fall. So Biddle suggests that in Genesis 24, you have this young teenager, Rebecca, who's traveled a long way to marry a man she's never met before. And when she finally nears the place uh, where he lives, ready to meet her, she sees a man in his 40s, in a field, relieving himself. And she falls off her camel in horror, explaining who is the man over there. Uh, and in the context of the patriarchs, that's a massive incredulity. The patriarchs are the fathers of the Israelite nations. They're meant to be the spiritual giants. The lineage of God's chosen people is traced through these people. Isaac was Abraham's heir, God's miraculous gift to Abraham. Rebecca is going to be the mother of Jacob, the grandmother of the 12 brothers uh, from Joseph and his amazing technical dream coat, the 12 brothers who are going to form the 12 tribes of Israel. In Jewish terms, this is a spiritual royal couple. And yet the first time they meet, he's going to the loo and she falls off a camel. This is an incredulity uh, that may at least make you smile, if not laugh out loud. In that Only Fools and Horses sketch, the words that Dale Boy speaks before he falls over are, play it nice and cool, my son, nice and cool, know what I mean? And these convey his desire to give off a persona which is completely undermined by his physical clumsiness. Uh, when Rebecca meets Isaac for the first time, the thought process may have been similar. Isaac, upon meeting his new bride, would probably want to convey a good impression, but instead her first sight of him is a man urinating. And Rebecca, the first impression she got was probably wanted to be someone who was all over it on the household and was going to be a good wife. But now she arrived, announces her arrival by falling off a camel. These are two examples of many. Uh, we don't have to face, I'm not going to talk about all of them, uh, but as we spend time in the scriptures and, and try and read between the lines, there are lots of instances like that 
uh, that we can look at. Um, I'm not going to go into every genre of comedy, but I'll just give you a couple of other uh, sort of funny highlights uh, from the Bible uh, that I like, which are good points for looking at where you might spot humour. Uh, so the prophets, uh, believe it or not, I think are actually a good source of humour uh, in the prophetic books. So the Old Testament, the prophets are regularly turned to satire and humour in order to mock the infidelities of the Jewish nation. Um, so I'm going to read you a quote uh, here from the Oxford Companion to the Bible. Uh, talking about the prophets, it says, They ridiculed the belief in idols and drew up a ridiculously exact list of the jewellery of luxurious women. Generalisations and exaggerations are also characteristic of prophetic discourse. Uh, my favourite example of uh, a prophet using humour is the prophet Elijah where he's in that battle with the priests of Baal. Uh, if you remember, um, they're both praying to see whose God will bring fire. And when the priests of Baal uh, pray for fire to Baal and Baal doesn't create fire, uh, Elijah really goes to town on them and he shouts, shout louder. Maybe he didn't hear you because he's on the loo. Uh, it, it's quite funny. You don't need to worry about the translation of it. It's just maybe sometimes we don't expect to see him in the Bible. Uh, so these little jibes uh, can escape past us if you don't see them. Uh, and if, if you've listened to me talk about Jonah, you'll know uh, what I think about Jonah and uh, being funny. So I won't, uh, I won't repeat that here. Uh, so the prophets, I think, are pretty funny. And then the book of Esther is a book that I think is really funny. Um, and again, I took this from Mark Biddle. And what he suggests, and I think he talked a lot of sense, is that the book of Esther isn't actually a historical book. And that is, in fact comedy book actually it's a bit like you know those silly um, articles in the in private eye i think it's a little bit like that because you see the story of esther when you read it in the bible is just full of completely ridiculous full-blown over-the-top details uh, so if you read the book of esther you'll note that the the story starts with the king of persia holding a lavish party that lasted 180 days so basically the book starts with a nation in the middle of a very violent and unstable region, spending six months with the entire ruling class and military absolutely bladdered and plastered. This was like Partygate kind of on steroids in the middle of the ancient Middle East. You would have thought if this had actually happened, Persia's enemies would have been invaded as quick as a flash. And yet there doesn't seem to be any kind of real um, downside to this six month binge other than the king and his wife get into an argument and the king starts looking for a new wife um, and the details of this are also ridiculous uh, so the king decides that Esther and all of uh, the attractive women in the nation are going to stop doing what they're doing and spend an entire year having beauty treatments in preparation for an audition to be his wife. Again, it's like Love Island on steroids. Um, and then you meet Herman, the villain of the piece, and he's got this plot to hat, he's patching this pot to kill Mordecai with a gallows. And we, again, we, we miss this because we might maybe not that familiar with cubits. But in chapter five, we're told he wants to build, he builds this gallows, which is 50 cubits high, uh, which apparently is the equivalent of 75 feet or seven and a half stories. And all of this, uh, this story concludes with the Jews being allowed to preemptively kill 75,000 of their enemies in two days. And, and this solution of preemptively killing that many people is an insane solution, but it only, it's only proposed, it's only accepted uh, because Persians are so bureaucratic that the king won't just cancel his royal edict to kill the Jews. Instead, he has to save the Jews by issuing another edict that allows them to kill everybody that was going to carry out the first one. So it's kind of mocking the bureaucracy of the Persians. And Biddle's suggestion for what Esther is about is that actually it's about how you respond to an invading and an occupying force. Because actually, 
the Jews at this point in history had been invaded and taken over and moved and were now living and being oppressed in a foreign land. And, and actually what happened in the book of Esther is we see this recognition that actually to survive in those circumstances, the people need to recognize how shallow the power of that empire that's oppressing them actually is. And they do that by recognizing the ridiculous nature of all that's going on, the Rid ridiculous bureaucracy of the Persians, the ridiculous use of wealth and their uh, prosperity and their over the topness and their drunkenness and all that kind of stuff. So the book of Esther is mocking the people that invaded and took over the Jews. And for us as modern readers, it maybe suggests to us how we are to view those who seek to undermine and destroy the gospel, perhaps. Um, so that's, that's my take on Esther, which comes heavily from uh, Mark E. Biddle. Uh, and then one final place uh, where I think there's humour in the Bible that I'm going to talk about now uh, is in the book of Acts. Uh, where you've got Luke describing the birth of the church and telling us how it's, the gospel spread uh, right through from Jerusalem all the way to Rome, the capital of the civilised world at that point. And in amongst this story that Luke is sharing with us, we get that excitement of the rapid spread of the gospel, that fear of oppression and that solidarity of living in the community. But Luke also shares a number of kind of humorous escapades and events with his readers that kind of remind us that it's people working under God's power uh, that do that. So for one example is when Peter is freed uh, from prison and he returns to the, um, for the Christians to show that he's been freed. There's this wonderful uh, moment where he knocks on the door, the door is answered. Um, the person that answers it is so shocked and surprised to see Peter. She rushes off to tell everybody else and just leaves Peter standing at the door which is such a human uh, brain freeze brain fart um, forgetting to invite Peter in and just leaving him outside uh, in the joy that he's there is such a human um, silliness uh, that he's um, he's recorded and of course you have the um, the other one that I love um, as a preacher uh, where you've got Paul who stays up all night preaching and there's this poor young lad um, who falls asleep because uh, Paul's so boring and falls out the window and dies because Paul's been going on for so long. But of course, in God's great power, he's uh, risen, from, he's brought back to life through prayer. Um, but it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, I hope I haven't bored you uh, too much. Uh, but I just want you to see that the Bible is funny and it should be funny. And actually, when we dig in to the humour of the Bible and when we're looking for it, um, it can add an extra layer and an extra dimension to our understanding of the scriptures and what they're teaching us um, about God. Um, as I said, I wrote a dissertation on this, so it's something I'm quite excited about <laughs> and I quite enjoy. Uh, I may be alone in that, but if, if, you, um, if you're interested in this as well, if you've spotted uh, funny bits, uh, do, do let me know. I love collecting uh, in funny instances uh, in the Bible. Um, so I don't know what we'll put up next week. We're doing it on a bit of an ad hoc basis. Uh, next week at some point uh, there will be another video of something uh, coming up so keep your eyes peeled uh, and I look forward to seeing you around soon. So take care, God bless and I will see you soon.